New Worlds. The readings for this week are Boccaccio, Decameron, the story of Sultan Saladin and Messer Torello, and Thomas More, Utopia, excerpts. When I get a little money, I buy books, and if any is left, I buy food and clothes. Quotation by Erasmus of Rotterdam, cool, possibly gay, Dutch early humanist and Catholic clergyman who should be much better known. First, a review. Last week, we got a brief glimpse of how the studies we now call the humanities were born, and a bit of what they consist of a study of human creations and inventions, art, music, and even what ev came eventually to be known as pure science. Basically, the term was adopted from the ancient Greek and Roman idea that the study of what was human could be separated from what was up to God, that the studies that people living in the medieval period, where human and divine were often mixed together, could nevertheless be sorted on the basis of whether they used superstition or superhuman elements to explain or remained with what could what one could see with one's eyes, observe, and make happen purely as a human being. We saw that the standard education offered, especially to those of high social status, consisted of Christianized versions of pagan literature, such as Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy and other works that relied on the ancient Greek and Roman ideals, but had been translated into a Christian context. We saw that during the late 14th to early 15th centuries, 1300s to 1400s, there was much social unrest. For instance, in the network of free commune cities covering most of Italy and other parts of Europe, and that many educated aristocratic men and women, including also Catholic clergy, monks, nuns, and abbesses within the church in Europe, began to look back into the past, leaping over the Middle Ages, so-called, to try to read ancient Greek and Roman authors in their original, unchristianized form, and to try to learn something new from them. This new perspective was called humanism, and it was like a new spirit sweeping through Europe. This week, we will take a look through the eyes of some contemporaries who fomented this new spirit. We will enter into three new worlds. First, late medieval Florence, Firenze, of the Italian prose writer and supreme storyteller Giovanni Boccaccio, 1313 to 1375, author of a book on famous wi women and of the 100 story storybook also addressed to women, the Decameron, from which one of your readings this week is taken. In fact, later generations considered Boccaccio together with Dante Alighieri from the previous generation of poets, 1265 to 1321, author of the Divine Comedy, and Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch, roughly contemporary with Boccaccio and a friend of his, 1304 to 1374, poet of love sonnets and scholar of the classics, to be the three crowns of Italian literature. Boccaccio, in particular, helped lay the foundations of humanism in his home city of Florence, Firenze, a place that would soon become central to the Renaissance in Italy, the home of the Medici family, the artists Sandro Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, and his younger contemporary Michelangelo, and so many more important figures. We will see more of Florence in coming lectures. The second new world we will enter into is the expanding vision of Europe itself, exemplified in the lives of two lifelong humanist friends, who, although connected to traditional Catholic church values, both were in fact priests, stood as champions of tolerance for all types of personal connection to God, often extending beyond traditional Christianity and connecting with those of the other Abrahamic faith traditions of Judaism and Islam. These two, Erasmus of Rotterdam, 1466 to 1536, and Sir Thomas More, 
1478 to 1535, caught in between the old and the new, managed to begin to articulate a new vision of human achievement. Sir Thomas More is the author of the second reading for this week, which is excerpted from his book, Utopia. In passing through, we'll meet some interesting Muslim historians, the Sultan Saladin, and a young Italian universalist philosopher who died tragically young, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, 1463 to 1494. The third and final new world we will take a, look, a brief look toward is, of course, the new world of the Americas from 1492 onward, which Europeans of this time pushed out into, looking for freedom, land, resources, new sources of material riches, and human workers of all kinds to sustain the European economic system, but which ultimately became a challenge to existing authority, an exercise in the wielding of force and power, and a space not only of new scientific discovery, but of colonization and intense exploitation. Let's begin with Boccaccio. Giovanni Boccaccio, 1313 to 1375. In some ways, Giovanni Boccaccio, who lived most of his life in Florence, in Italy, and the small town outside it, Certaldo, where he may have been born, out of wedlock to a merchant of Florence, Boccaccino di Chellino, and a woman who remains unknown to us today, lived a very typical late medieval, early Renaissance life. His father's occupations controlled where the family lived. When Boccaccio was 13, his father was appointed to be the broker for a prominent family and moved his children and their stepmother to Naples to live. Boccaccio seems not to have wanted to go into commerce, and so he was permitted to go to the local university, called Studium, but now known as University of Naples, to study church law, canon law that is, the special religious and living ordinances particular to the Catholic Church of the time, for the next six years, an extended course of study that would, if he were successful, lead him to a job as a lawyer for the church or one of the bishops or archbishops. He did find time to study literature and science, however, and he made friends who would help him to do something other than law, to move up in the world and express himself artistically. Another avenue for networking was offered by his father, the merchant, because Naples, being a kingdom unto itself, had a nobility and, in fact, a king, Robert the Wise. The city was small enough that his father could speak to the upper-class folks, and he dragged little Giovanni with him. Daily life probably consisted of helping his father out, studying church law, and meeting important people, and, of course, falling in love with the local princess, whom he called in his ardent poems to her, Fiametta, or Little Fiery One, Little Flame. Giovanni was clearly cut out to be a poet. He himself had to acknowledge it was his one true calling. He began hanging out, making the scene with groups of experimental poets in town, trying different rhyme schemes and rhythmic lines out, creating new forms of the sonnet, swapping poems and writing romantic poems about the women he loved, based on characters out of the Greek myths. Il Filostrato, or The Lover Who Died for Love, was based on a medieval romance, a romance about Troy, and featured Boccaccio's fiery little crush, Fiametta, prominently. Later, it formed the basis of Troilus and Cressida, the story that Chaucer and Shakespeare told. Teseida was later borrowed by Chaucer as well, and Boccaccio's poem, Diana's Hunt, listed the women of the town of Naples. Boccaccio seems to have spent most of his time with women, in fact, one way or another. A while later in his life, he would write the first set of actual biographies of women, 106 of them, real life and mythological, ever in Italian literature. The book was called On Famous Women, De Claris Mulieribus, and he wrote it in 1374. Unfortunately, his love for Fiametta remained unrealized. She starred in a lot of his poems, but Boccaccio by now was part of the literati, and he was even holding positions in the local government, such as ambassador. Boccaccio had, in fact, a style, 
he was very much a fan of ancient Greek mythological stories and characters, and though he was a good Catholic, he believed the stories could be used well and morally by Christians as well as, quote, Gentiles, as they called non-Christians, like the pagan Greeks. He even wrote a sort of handbook of mythology for poets to help his contemporaries use the Greek myths more easily and accurately in their storytelling and poetry. But the King of Naples and the leadership of Florence had a huge falling out due to the fact that the nobleman put in charge of Florence had huge unpaid debts to the King of Naples, and this forced Giovanni Boccaccio to move back to his home city of Florence. Like so many Italians who lived in cities that they had adopted, the politics could get very personal as the cities were small and prominent citizens were very well known to one another. If they had grudges, they might force their dependents to choose sides. Now, when Boccaccio came back home to Florence, a much bigger and more important man than when he had left, two things struck him. First, the local workers, the small folks, il popolo minute, that is, the workers, not the nobility or the bourgeoisie, had taken over the government and overthrown the local nobleman with the huge debts, along with his rich friends. He had tried to finance the debts with outrageous flat taxes and extreme measures to shift the burden onto the populace and away from his own substantial fortunes and those of his friends. This was perhaps only to be expected, remember the communes, and might even have been a step forward toward independence for the citizens, but left Florence struggling economically and politically. Second, just the year before Boccaccio came home, the city had lost half, or even by some estimates, three quarters of its citizens to the plague. It was a horrifying scene. Boccaccio's own stepmother had died in the plague, and his father was extremely busy organizing help for plague victims and survivors, burials, adoptions of orphans, and other community supports. Most families had lost many members to the plague, and the city must have seemed to be in perpetual mourning, piles of bodies needing burial, and the continual fear of touching anything that had touched the bodies of those with the disease, as that could prove fatal. It is in this environment that he began working on writing the stories in his Decameron. Now let us turn to that book. The Decameron of Boccaccio is a work of fiction, a book written in beautiful prose and in the vernacular Florentine Italian language, not Latin. Boccaccio, as narrator, expects his readers to be young women, trapped at home, idle, unable to participate in the kind of activities the men did, with much leisure, perhaps, but also scared, bored out of their minds, and possibly depressed or distracted, and full of unfulfilled desires of all kinds, especially romantic and sexual. As a result, many of the stories deal with love, deception, friendship, and even simply with sex. They tend to be secular stories, although they do have strong moralizing tendencies. Each one has its lesson, Many of the stories take a very sharp and critical attitude toward the monks, clergy, and church nobility, these grand personages in the experience of a humble trader or poet such as Boccaccio saw himself to be were often liars and cheats. The book consists of 100 stories told by 10 young people, seven women, three men, who are fleeing the city of Florence temporarily to get away from the sorrow of having lost so many close family members seeing the burning and sometimes the unburied corpses in the streets and watching the horror of it all. They meet in a church that they've retired to in order to get away from it all. And they decide, since some of the women have family estates in the countryside, to visit one of those estates for two weeks or so to try to amuse themselves, enjoy some fresh air and outdoor activities, and get their minds off the terror and sorrow. The estate is just a little outside of town, not far by carriage ride, but secluded enough for them to relax. Each day, for fun and to pass the time, each of the friends tells one story. So each day, everyone hears 10 stories in total. And for each storytelling day, they choose a king or queen from among them for the day who rules over the storytelling and selects the order. They rest on Sundays, the Sabbath, 
and do chores on one other day per week. So in all, they stay at the estate for 14 days, a fortnight, as it was called, two weeks. Since there are 10 storytelling days, in all they tell 100 stories. Some are short, some longer, some simple, some involved. Many talk about love, and in quite a few, including ours, the services of necromancers, sorcerers, or magicians are utilized, the dead are brought back to life, bands of honest robbers help people out, similar to stories of Robin Hood, lovers are found to be honorable and trustworthy, long journeys with magical elements are undertaken, and marvelous amounts of jewels and wealth change hands. Interesting side note. The stories have various origins. Some are traditional Italian, German, or French fairy tales. Some are refashioned from ancient Greek stories, and some come from other compilations of stories, even those told by Marco Polo, 1254 to 1324. He's, uh, he traveled the Silk Road, 1271 to 1295, and published a book around 1300 called The Travels of Marco Polo, or Il Minione, as he was called whom, since he was a Venetian and Venice was a rival city-state to Florence, Boccaccio did not like. So he doesn't cite Marco Polo by name when he uses one of his stories, for instance, about Kublai Khan. But they're there. The story that you are reading is told by Panfilo, the character All Love, the same young man who told the story, the first story on the first day. He is king for this final day. The tale is about a traitor, Messer Torello, an Italian traitor, who happens in his traveling across the country to meet up with the famous Sultan Saladin. Al Nasir Salah al Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, Ayyub uh, 1137 to 1193, first Sultan of both Egypt and Syria and leader of the military campaign against the European crusaders in the Levant during the 12th century, about 200 years before Boccaccio's time. Saladin was a Kurdish Sunni leader whose sultanate at its height spanned Egypt, Syria, the Jazeera, that is upper Mesopotamia, the Hejaz in Western Arabia, Yemen, and parts of Western North Africa and Nubia. This Saladin would have been well known to Boccaccio's reading audience. He, like many of the figures from the era of the Crusades, was basically a romantic hero now. 200 years on, he was famous for his diplomacy, his righteousness, his generosity, and his kindness to Christians who fell into his hands during the long period of time that the Crusades were being fought. In particular, he was remembered as the Muslim leader who, in taking over Jerusalem, managed to avoid almost all bloodshed. In fact, on the first day of storytelling, Philomena, who here has just spoken about friendship, tells another famous story about Saladin, namely the Three Ring Parable. For more about this story, uh, you could look for Nathan the Wise. As he opens his story, Panfilo makes a comment about the story Philomena just told. Her name means beloved, with a moral about friendship. Take time now to read Panfilo's story about Messer Torello and Saladin, the ninth story on the tenth and last storytelling day of the Decameron, before hearing me speak about it in the next section. Note, there's an audio recording that I've made available to help you get through the text. The English translation can be rather old-fashioned sometimes. Okay, I hope you enjoyed reading and or listening to the story. So let's think about what you just heard. Boccaccio opens by having Panfilo comment on Philomena's previous story on friendship, which sets us up for the theme of kindness and generosity to guests and foreigners as the moral for this story of Saladin and Messer Torello. Some things to notice about this story. The moral is given by Panfilo right up front. Quote, albeit by reason of our vices, it may not be possible for us to gain to the full the friendship of any. Yet, by the matters whereof you shall hear in my story, we may at least be incited to take delight in doing good offices, in the hope that sooner or later 
we may come by our reward thereof." End quote. That is, even though we're bound to be imperfect friends to others because we're only human, as long as we try very hard and never stop taking pleasure in doing good for our friends, we may eventually get showered with gifts of friendship ourselves. So keep trying to do good for your friends and for guests, as we see. Some more interesting points you may have noticed. Although Boccaccio's narrator is talking about the time of the Crusades under Emperor Frederick I, still Saladin, although technically the enemy of the Christians in their attempt to recover the Holy Land, immediately uh, you know, is introduced as that most valiant prince Saladin. And uh, you know, the storyteller tells us that he is doing reconnaissance before battle, disguised as a merchant in northern Italy, no less, between Milan and Pavia, at which point they meet Messer, that is Monsieur or, or Mr. Torello, who was out hunting with his dogs and falcons and servants along with him, heading for an estate of his on the Ticino River near Pavia. Torello guessed them to be gentlemen and foreigners, and being zealous to do them honor, tricks them into coming to his home for dinner and a night's rest, and it just gets more polite from there. While Torello is hosting the Kurdish military men, he notices that they are even more noble in manner than he'd thought, and decides he must give them even better hospitality in the morning. He sends off and sets everything up, and in the morning uh, brings them to another estate of his, gives them a breakfast, and send off to suit royalty, even though they've been telling him they are simply Cypriot merchants. Torello shares his hawk experience with them, uh, expertise with them, gives them beautiful strong horses to replace their old tired ones, and Torello's wife gives them wonderful robes lined with silk and fur there. Saladin wryly remarks to his men that, quote, if the Christian kings are as kingly as he is knightly, there is none of them whose onset the Sultan of Babylon might well abide. End quote. Torello suspects them to be more noble than they're letting on, but lets them go, only to be captured by Saladin's army when he himself goes off to the Crusades. But all's well that ends well, also with the substory of Torello's request to his beloved wife that even if pressured into marriage when he's absent too long during the war, she wait at least one year, one month, and one day until she weds another man. He returns, thanks to Saladin's helpful necromancer, just in the nick of time to stop the wedding and regain his bride. Now, there are some really wonderful details in the story, which I hope you will have noticed. The biggest surprise, perhaps, is that the Crusades themselves, wars that lasted so long and were fought so viciously, fade into a soft background against which the friendship of Torello and the Sultan Saladin stands out. They both share a gentleman's background and both try to outdo one another in hospitality. How can this be that two people who could have been sworn enemies, Christian Crusader versus Islamic Sultan, and who do meet each other on the battlefield, wind up best friends? The favorable, in fact, heroic version of Saladin is common in non-theological storytelling about the Sultan during this time period. The Latin traditions around him, for instance, the ones that were aimed at the church, are a bit stern, while the French and Old French sources, which are more secular, tend to be lenient or favorable towards him. This is the inheritance of the late medieval period when travels such as Marco Polo made to China and far off voyages to the ends of the earth had been reorienting the European traders and middle class, and in fact, offering them education about the others out in the world, beyond Europe, beyond Christendom, even beyond the Jews and Muslims, whom they merely knew from going through the Jewish quarter or the Muslim quarter within their own cities sometimes. Um, it turns out that Boccaccio and his generation of Italian artists and writers had access to stories from these travelers who others, or others who had indeed visited India, China, the southern part of Africa, and soon the Americas. And they took them in as ways of broadening their social world to include foreigners in their code of guest friendship, even across barriers of language and culture. Torello and Saladin, in the end, are really portrayed as kindred souls. 
Before we turn to the Catholic humanist friends, Erasmus and Sir Thomas More, and uh, another way in which these new worlds were appearing, let's take a closer look at the relations between the three, quote, Abrahamic faiths, end quote, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, during Boccaccio's time and a little bit after. How did they coexist during this period? It's easy to forget that Saladin was not just a made-up fictional figure that the Europeans could imagine as a kind, generous, and just sultan, a worthy and honorable opponent on the battlefield. He was actually a real sultan and had a real retinue. And among his retinue were artists and historians and even scientists. Just as King Richard the Lionheart and the rest of the Crusaders had historians and poets to write about their deeds, and as Alexander the Great in antiquity had had historians with him on the march, so Ali ibn al-Athir, 1160 to 1233, a contemporary and member of the Kurdish retinue of Saladin, was taking the opportunity of going on campaign with him around 1231 CE to compose one of the most important Islamic historical works of all time, the ambitious Al-Kamil fit Tariq, that's to say, The Complete History was its title. This history dealt in annals-like encyclopedic fashion year by year with important developments around the world. He noted developments in the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Christians who still held Byzantium and some other places around and spoke Greek, the Rus in the area now known as Russia, and among the Franks, that is, the Muslims' name for the Christians in Western Europe. Al-Athir was trying to write a universal history of mankind that included everyone, made sense of the cosmos, and placed human beings into their rightful spot in the order of things. He was not alone, either within the Islamic world or outside in the Christian and Jewish worlds. Scientific discoveries and historical research was a common touchstone. A century later, other encyclopedias, uh, encyclopedists were still working. Al-Nuwairi, 1279 to 1333, was writing an extensive encyclopedia of the arts and humanities called The Ultimate Ambition in the Arts of Erudition. There is a Penguin edition available if you want to check it out. It still exists. Abulfida, 1273 to 1331, a Kurdish geographer historian, prince, and governor, was following in Al-Athir's footsteps, writing a sketch of the countries, as he called it, which included all major towns of the world, including those even in China, with their correct latitude and longitude, founding his calculations on Ptolemy and Muhammad al-Idrisi, and picking up the complete history of Al-Athir where he, it left off and continuing it into his own day with his concise history of humanity, as he called his book. Moreover, one century forward, and we find a new kind of encyclopedia covering Islamic religion, conduct, law, spiritual qualities, work, natural history, music, food, and medicine being created by an Egyptian writer, al ibshihi 1388 to 1448. And these are just a few. There are many more poets, musicians, authors, historians, etc., putting effort into the kinds of works the Christian and Jewish writers were also interested in at this time from their own perspectives. The name for the area of the Iberian Peninsula conquered and held by various Muslim dynasties, starting with Umayyad, uh, the greatest extent 719, uh, and continuing under the Caliphate of Cordoba, was Al-Andalus. Prominent cities that flourished with large Muslim, Jewish, and Christian populations intermixed were Toledo, Cordoba, the Muslim capital, Saragossa, a major frontier city, and Seville, an important intellectual center. We'll hear more about Seville as time goes on, um, in including some famous stories that we're gonna read. Al-Andalus remained more or less under Muslim rule for about 700 years, seven centuries. Its influence on all of the Iberian Peninsula, encompassing the areas now known as Spain and Portugal, and related parts of Europe, 
was profound. In addition, the religious tolerance in Al-Andalus was such during these seven centuries that large Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities of scholars communicated with each other and handed on ancient wisdom to one another, and new wisdom sometimes, from the Greek, Byzantine, Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic texts they preserved, rediscovered, or reinterpreted. Each was spurred on, at first by their love of and care for their own sacred texts, but the scholarly networks they developed formed the basis of the university system across Europe and England. The three oldest colleges of Oxford University were founded in the 13th century, between 1249 and 1264. In Spain, of course, universities spurred on by Islamic learning centers were earlier. The University of Salamanca, the oldest still extant university in Spain, was founded in 1134 in the middle of Al-Andalus. So that's a century before the oldest Oxford college. The push to understand the entire contents of the world as manifested in the encyclopedic impulse of this era was shared among all faith communities of the Mediterranean. Before we move on, just a quick nod of appreciation to the brief but brilliant philosophical and Kabbalistic career of the quirky young Italian thinker of this era, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, 1463 to 1494. He managed, because of the incredible mixing of cultures in the Mediterranean at this time, to travel from university to university for seven years, from 1480 to 1487, moving from Ferrara to Padua, Florence, and Paris, studying Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic at the chief universities of Italy and France. He went on to contribute to world literature an inspiring oration on the dignity of man that is read to this day, an intensely original, expansive, and cosmopolitan vision of humanity's place within the universe, one that was built not only on the ancient Greek and Roman philosophical traditions and contemporary European Christian theologies, but on angel hierarchies, Islam, ancient Egyptian and Iranian, Chaldean and Zoroastrian traditions, arcane numerology, astrology, and more. He was, young though he died at 31, responsible for and for, uh, uh, for the flourishing of Christian Kabbalah as a movement rooted in Jewish mysticism and glimpses of a fabulously broad approach to scholarship that embraced almost every possible human spiritual tradition. Pico was the first Christian to treat knowledge of Jewish Kabbalah, a mystical path of studies involving number magic, as valuable. Flavius Mithridates, his most prolific Jewish informant, translated and mistranslated sometimes thousands of pages of Kabbalah into Latin for him. Pico's essentially humanist vision said God created man such that he had no specific slot in the chain of being like other animals. Instead, men could shift their position because they were capable of learning from and imitating any existing creature. We could ascend the chain of being toward the angels and communion with God by using our minds. The idea that men could ascend the chain of being through the exercise of their intellectual capacities was a profound endorsement of the dignity of human existence in this earthly life. Only human beings could change themselves through their own free will. And this was important because this was focusing on life now and our intellect now, not in the afterlife. We will have a chance to explore the cultural mixture later. Suffice it for now to say that from 700 CE through and beyond the fall of Granada and the Alhambra to Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492, Muslim and Jewish communities in Europe interacted with one another, read each other's books, and lived relatively peacefully together. There, there were exceptions, of course. Um, they shared a common respect for books and learning. Muslims brought the first paper and the first printing press to Spain. And despite differences, the groups often shared food, clothing styles, architectural and design ideas, music, and visual art styles.
Moore and Erasmus, two humanist priests. Our second new world is an intellectual one. During this time in Europe, having a friend or teacher of a different faith from one's own, traveling to places where the customs were different, was becoming commonplace, as we saw. The new turn toward humanism reached the entire literate world. It was encouraging international exchanges of dialogue and thinking. Ultimately, it would lead to the radical reform of the institutions and reasoning of the Christian church from within the Catholic Reformation and from outside the Protestant Reformation. Two lifelong friends from different countries who shared a religious persuasion, talent for writing, a love of scholarship, and a broadly humanist philosophy, Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, 1466 to 1536, Dutch, and Sir Thomas More, 1478 to 1535, later by Catholics called Saint Thomas More, English, are good examples of how exciting as well as dangerous these changes were. The keynotes of Moore's life was self-determination through education and willpower, and he shared this conviction with everyone in his circles of influence. In one of his early poems, he has a personified figure of fortune pro proclaim, now in this point there is no more to say, each man hath of himself the governance. Let every white then follow his own way. White, W-I-G-H-T, means uh, person. That is, fortune tells us that it's our choice. You may carpe diem or not. It would be better if you did, but no one is going to force you to do it. In addition, and despite his controversial life and death, Moore was essentially drawn to the middle road in philosophical and religious questions, and seems to have tried extremely hard to reconcile his own and others' opposing instincts and reasons on humanism and the Catholic Church, both of which he was loyal to. He believed strongly in educating girls and boys equally, an unusual position in his time. When he married Jane Colt in 1505, he told his friend Erasmus that he wanted to give his young wife a better education than she had received at home. So he tutored her in music and literature. <laughs> they had four children together, three girls, one boy, Sadly, Jane died just six years later, and, and Moore remarried and raised his new wife, Alice's daughter, from a previous marriage as his own. He also became guardian to two young girls. He wrote letters to all his children when away and encouraged them to write often. He insisted upon giving his daughters the same classical education as his son, and his oldest daughter, Margaret, was known and admired for being particularly fluent in Greek and Latin. His decision to educate his daughters influenced other noble families, and his friend Erasmus as well. Moore followed a political career and became counselor to Henry VIII, who was a good friend to him. Now, this underrated king presented himself as the image of a Renaissance man. Henry had created around him, at court, an atmosphere of scholarly and artistic innovation, and even athleticism. A musician himself, he played lute and organ, sight read and sang well. He even composed music, although contrary to rumors, he probably did not write the song Greensleeves, unfortunately. Sadly, Henry, the first English king with a modernist, a modern humanist education, also felt very strongly about radically reshaping the church and making himself as king its head in England, which led him to bitterly oppose more who refused to acknowledge Henry as king of the church, and in particular refused to acquiesce in Henry's annulment of his first marriage, which was against Catholic doctrine at that time. Convicted of treason and unwilling to stand down, Thomas More was executed by his former very close friend, King Henry. More is said to have prayed before the execution and shamed the executioner in doing so. There's also a story that as he knew he was being beheaded, he asked the executioner to avoid chopping his beard when he chopped off his head, because my beard is innocent of any treason. Hundreds of years afterwards, Pope Pius XI canonized Sir Thomas More in 1935 as a martyr, so he is now known to Christians as uh, St. Thomas More to Catholics. Although More never broke, 
as Henry did with the Catholic Church. And in fact, he took orders and became a priest. Moore was absolutely convinced, like many Catholics, that the Church needed reform badly. His imagination took him to a world where justice would always be done and where society would be reasonable and allow for differences of opinion, especially on religious questions. He tried to imagine this world and set it down on paper in a book he titled Utopia, or Nowhere. It's worth pointing up that the reforms in this book went far beyond just tweaking the system. Moore imagined an entirely new society grounded in fairness and justice, where money and trade did not hold sway, as in the world he lived in, and the citizens shared their possessions with one another routinely and happily, where people with various ways of thinking about and worshiping God peacefully coexisted, and even atheism could exist, although he admitted he didn't favor it. In short, where one's conscience could be one's guide to life, and one could make choices freely without social, political, or economic pressure being brought to bear. There are, as you will see when reading the excerpts from Thomas More's Utopia, definite blind spots. He does not have his ideal society eliminate all slavery, for example. He does confine it to those convicted of crimes. This apparently whimsical book of social blueprints and ideas for bettering ourselves and ridding ourselves of excessive authoritarianism inspired many copiers, and in fact it began a new genre of utopian and ultimately dystopian fiction. Early on, Francis Bacon, Samuel Butler, and Voltaire all created utopias in novel form, and all world-building fantasy fiction today, science fiction today, owes a debt to Thomas More. Take a moment now and read the excerpts from Moore's book. Be sure to think about and take notes as you read on what your own utopia will look like if you plan to do this week's meditation essay. Catholics and Protestants alike defended Thomas More's character at the time, and later, among them Jonathan Swift, William Shakespeare, the leftist U.S. Senator Eugene McCarthy, who ran for president in the 60s, and conservative Catholics, as well as Marxists and atheists, have paid him tribute. If you would like to see more about Sir Thomas More's amazing life, you could do worse than check out the 1966 movie A Man for All Seasons, and there's also one that was done in 1988, starring Charlton Heston. <laughs> so, Desiderius Erasmus. 1466 to 1536. Moore's lifetime friend and fellow Catholic and humanist Erasmus also paid him tribute. He said of him that his character was, quote, more pure than any snow, unquote, and that Moore had a genius, quote, such as England never had and never again will have, unquote. Now, Erasmus, also known as Erasmus of Rotterdam. It's unfair to introduce him as a friend of Thomas More, because Erasmus's reputation is unshakable. He was and is much more widely celebrated than his friend Thomas More, really, as one of the first humanists, one of the founding parents of the Renaissance, and a humane thinker. Like Thomas More, he had a firm belief in our ability as humans to do better than we are doing, to organize our society, our economic world, our self-educational tools so as to improve, to live more compassionately with one another. Part of his vision, as part of Moore's, was that the original Christian society seemed to be egalitarian and communal once you got back to the actual sources and stopped listening to tendentious interpretations given by church heads. Also, leaping over the Middle Ages and coming face to face with in Erasmus's case, the Greek text of the New Testament, and trying to understand it as written. Erasmus's early life was marked by the plague, as were they all. After beginning school in a place where he could actually begin learning Greek at a young age, um, and where he learned, due to a progressive schoolmaster, about one's personal relationship with God, he had to leave school altogether 
when plague struck the town of Deventa, where his school was, and his mother died from the infection. He did what you needed to do in the Middle Ages when orphaned. He went to take vows as a Catholic priest, so the church could support him with food and housing. He did not actually warm to being a priest, however, and found many abuses happening that he wrote about later in his calls to reform the church. Erasmus may have been gay. He supposedly fell in love with a fellow priest, writing a series of passionate letters in which he called the priest half my soul and wrote, I have wooed you both unhappily and relentlessly. He also was once dismissed as a tutor on a similar charge of having fallen in love with his charge. However, this may be, he, however this may be, he stayed in the closet during his life. Um, he even wrote against uh, homosexuality. And there isn't much other evidence of lovers or passionate attachments that has come down through the years to us. Luckily, because he didn't really want to be a priest in the sense that we saw, he was given dispensation from his religious vows by the Pope and was allowed to pursue his beloved humanistic studies, languages, books, and the life of a lecturing academic. He never really settled down. Jumping from the Netherlands, where he was born, to England, where he met Thomas More and other Renaissance men of Henry's court, becoming a professor at Cambridge Colleges for a while, then moving to Basel, Switzerland, he lived the life of an itinerant scholar. Meanwhile, he tackled huge scholarly jobs, such as organizing and revising and correcting the Latin New Testament done by St. Jerome, reading the original Greek and sharing notes on it with others, attacking superstitions, and even attacking the Western Church in a satirical treatise he called In Praise of Folly. He wrote it in 1511. This work he wrote while staying with his friend Thomas More for a week in London. It's hard to overestimate the importance of what Erasmus was doing. He remained a priest within the Catholic Church while publishing constant criticisms and promulgating a new kind of tolerance and calm debate style that he thought was the best way to move forward. He did not want the, to leave the church, but he argued for moderation, extreme moderation, so to speak, and against the death penalty in an era when the church was sponsoring harsher and harsher measures against heretics and facing a new threat from the German super reformer Luther, about whom in another lecture. Gentle, moderate, tolerant Erasmus was incredibly popular as a writer in his lifetime. By the 1530s, his last years, the writings of Erasmus accounted for 10 to 20 percent of all book sales in Europe. He had clearly encapsulated a point of view that was widespread, despite what the church and its leaders were doing every day. In his day, and even after, Erasmus's tolerance beat out intolerant views. Although he was often pu being pushed to be more stringent and more partisan, he, like his friend Thomas More, stood up against the pressure for the most part. You may have heard of a book titled The Prince on statesmanship and holding on to power by a certain Niccolo Machiavelli. But three years before Machiavelli's very astringent book came out, as Machiavelli advises rulers, for instance, to lie when necessary, to keep power however possible, and to track your enemies closely. Erasmus, three years before, had already put out a much milder and more humanely imagined book, appealing to honor and sincerity on the part of rulers and placing an emphasis on their seeing themselves as servants of the people. Machiavelli had quoted the ancient Romans, uh, let them hate me as long as they fear me. Uh, you know, Erasmus had gone a different route. Let the prince be actually loved and let the prince have a well-rounded education in humanities in order to govern justly and generously and avoid becoming an oppressor of one's own people. Erasmus called his book, Education of a Christian Prince and dedicated it to the young King Charles of Spain, who would later become Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Erasmus summed up the tolerant 
argument of his age very well when he wrote to a friend of his, quote, that you are patriotic will be praised by many and easily forgiven by everyone. But in my opinion, it is wiser to treat men and things as though we held this world the common fatherland of all, end quote. He, again like his friend Moore, thought that being patriotic, loyal to one's king and so forth was fine, unless your sense of justice led you to a higher ground. The best attitude to have as a human being, Erasmus and Moore seemed to agree, was that you were a citizen of the world, that humanity as a whole, not just the tribe or nation, state or city you happened to grow up in, deserved your total loyalty and commitment. We might call this idea Renaissance universalism. At any rate, its time had come, and perhaps its time is still here today. Three, <clears throat> the new world of the Americas. Emma Goldman said, before we can forgive one another, we have to understand one another. It is not usually within the purview of a historian to seek forgiveness for the past, but it is a sacred task of any historian to seek to understand, not for the sake of forgiving, that is a political and social result sometimes of better understanding, however, but for its own sake, in order to be able to compass the range of humanity within one's own mind and to reflect what has happened and what is happening in the human world accurately. Humans are a gregarious species. It is a truism among graphic artists, illustrators, and actors that one of the best ways of drawing attention from your audience is to include a representation of a person, usually the face of a person, especially the face of a person. This has an almost magnetic effect on the human eye. We seek each other out incessantly. But actually understanding another person can take a very much longer time and requires work. So it happened that after 700 some years of living together in the same space, sharing art and literature and music, teaching crafts to and giving performances to and with one another, obeying one another's rules, learning each other's customs and habits, European Christians of goodwill, like Boccaccio, were able to present Muslim leaders of the centuries before them, like Saladin, as sharing the civilized qualities of the best contemporary gentlemen living in Italy at present, during Boccaccio's own time. Within the next century, humanists like Erasmus and Thomas More and, uh, and Pico would be able to articulate ideas about common humanity, the relative nature of most religious convictions, and the ability of humans to improve their toleration of and social relationships with one another consciously through studying one another's languages. Some, like Moore, actually tried in their halting way to write about a future in which humans had progressed to a better state of society by pulling away from commerce, trade, and money, building toleration of different religious perspectives, and focusing communal life on the humane arts, medicine, education, and language. In 1492, all of this was put to a dramatic new test, as Christopher Columbus and his crew, who were hardly humanists of this or any kind, sailed across the ocean in order to promote single-minded trading and money-making and commerce, and instead met humans with unfamiliar languages and ways of life they had never imagined before, who were placed like guardians over an entire two continents, the Americas, full of unimaginable wealth and resources. This was literally a new place on earth to them. The Europeans who came to exploit and send back across the sea for profit, raw materials, jewels, new plants and animals, and even people, were not at first themselves humanists, 
especially when it came to understanding the inhabitants of the Americas as humans. But the encounter in the Americas quickly became food for thought, philosophizing, and artwork of all kinds back in, in Europe. Later, Enlightenment ideals would inform and inspire revolutions in British American colonies, Haiti, and elsewhere in the New World, but these notions were far from the minds of the early Europeans exploiting what they still called the Indies for wealth. It is remarkable that Bartolomé de, de las Casas, a Spanish Catholic Dominican friar or priest, an early advocate for native inhabitants of the Americas who were being exploited, tortured, and killed on a regular basis during the early 1500s already, had to argue explicitly to his very well-educated audience, Prince Philip II of Spain, that the native inhabitants of the Indies were indeed humans. He got very little material response when he wrote, his short account of the destruction of the Indies, Brevissima Relacion de la Destrucción de las Indias, in 1542, it was published in 1552, about the mistreatment of and atrocities committed against indigenous peoples of the Americas in the new colonies. On a very practical level, new materials were shipped back and used in Europe. Quote, materials ranging from Asian textiles to Caribbean pearls and coral, as well as non-European animals and people, were included in portraits as symbols of the refinement of the sitter. End quote. That's from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts wonderful page that you can check out. Moreover, the New World offered new colors to artists. European artists had used red ochre, a dull red-brown color that had can be extracted from iron-rich earth to capture the color red in their paintings for ages. I mean, it had been used for 40,000 years. But now there came back from the Americas a brilliant red pigment made from the bodies of cochineal scale insects that were grown in the Americas on prickly pear cactuses by native artists who created an intense biodegradable and sustainable dye from them. Intensely red cochineal has a long and famous history in painters' palettes, tapestry, and fabrics, and has been used for centuries to color or stain tissues, red or purple, for microscope visibility in biology and microbiology labs, medicine, and dentistry. Uh, that comes from Biocontrol Beat, um, a great page you can check out on pigments of the imagination, cochineals, and how they were used in the Renaissance. The pigment is used today as food coloring and to color lipstick, rouge, and nail polish. During the Renaissance, painters in Europe would search for the cochineal dye tincture by going to a local pharmacist or chemist, since it also had scientific and medical uses to clean teeth and prepared with vinegar to cure wounds. There were so many valuable and strange new perspectives available to European Christians of the late medieval and early Renaissance period as they moved to challenge long unquestioned government science and arts. We'll see more of the new world as time moves on in our course. We took a look here into three new worlds, just briefly. First, the changing world of late medieval Florence, Firenze, during the plague years, especially the poetry and art circles frequented by the great story teller Giovanni Boccaccio and his friend Petrarch. Second, the expanding world of Europe as seen by the early humanists and friends, Sir Thomas More and Erasmus, and their young universalist contemporary Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, as well as some Muslim universalist historians with similar ideas. And third, we looked at the Americas very, very briefly, which the European colonizers literally labeled the New World, and which, with its resources and perspectives, revolutionized the art practices as well as humanist ideas and the economy itself during the European Renaissance, ultimately contributing to challenges to existing authorities. Next time, more about those challenges.